Let's test to see how many spiral-shaped objects you can find around you right now. I'll bet there's more than you think. A spiral may be hidden in the flower petals of your houseplants. One might be staring at you from that seashell you brought home from your last trip to the beach. If none of these objects sound familiar, you might want to head over to the mirror and turn to the side a bit. In case you haven't noticed yet, even our own ears are shaped like a spiral. Why does Mother Nature seem to have such a preference for this shape? Many theories wish to explain this weird behavior. One of them is based on the Fibonacci sequence. This Italian mathematician didn't really care much for spirals initially. He was studying rabbits when he came up with this theory. Fibonacci came up with the sequence as a solution to a problem involving the growth of a population of rabbits. Let's recreate his experiment. If you put a pair of rabbits in an enclosed space, how many pairs of rabbits will you find there after a year? To solve this problem, Fibonacci proposed some conditions for his theoretical experiment. That all rabbits are born as a pair, one male, one female. Also, the rabbits can start reproducing after one month. More so, each pair of rabbits produces one pair of offspring each month. And lastly, none of the rabbits kicks the bucket at the end of the year. Now, using these assumptions, Fibonacci noticed the following sequence. 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, 21, 34, 55, 89, 144, and so on. The first two numbers in the sequence, 1, 1, represent the initial pair of rabbits. The next number, 2, represents the number of pairs of rabbits after the first month. One pair of the initial rabbits plus one pair of offspring. The fourth number, 3, represents the number of pairs after the second month. Two pairs of the initial rabbits plus one pair of offspring. And so on. He soon noticed that his series is made out of numbers in which each number is the sum of the previous two numbers. A lot of other mathematicians have looked at this sequence over the years. They were soon surprised to discover that this system was found in many natural structures, such as the arrangement of leaves on a stem and the arrangements of seeds on a sunflower. If you don't understand why it is so, then grab a piece of paper and a pen. Together, let's try to draw the Fibonacci spiral. You'll have to start with a small circle at the center of your page and then draw larger circles around it without lifting the pen from the paper, using the numbers from the Fibonacci sequence. For example, the first circle is 0 units wide, the second circle is 1 unit wide, the third circle is 1 unit wide, and so on. As you keep adding more circles, they will fit together perfectly to form a spiral shape. The spiral gets bigger and bigger, but it always follows the same pattern based on the Fibonacci sequence. Another famous spiralist was a man named James Bell Pettigrew. He was a Scottish naturalist that became fascinated by the mystery of the spiral shape, which he noticed almost everywhere in nature. He studied it at all scales, from giant nebulae in space to tiny molecules. Despite his research, he couldn't figure out where the spiral came from. He was sure that it couldn't be just a physical thing, and he believed that organs and plants and animals are not only shaped like spirals, but they also work in a spiral way. At the center of lifetime work on this unique shape was the human heart. Pettigrew believed that the heart's spiral structure was the mystery of all mysteries. He also thought this shape was to blame for both its muscular contractions and how the blood seemed to travel within our mighty tickers. The reason why the spiral seems to be everywhere might be really simple. Efficiency. Take a look at the basic sunflower, for example. It figured out a way to display its seeds so that it could expose them to the sun equally, without wasting any space and without being limited in their growth. Spiral stairs are another great example, too. They just work better. You find it easier to climb them, and they should take less space than the usual ones. We also might be more inclined to notice this shape more than others. That's because a spiral shape, or its proportions, is more aesthetically pleasing to the human eye. It's the reason why interior designers, artists, or illustrators often use these principles in their work. The spiral symbol is also the oldest symbol found in every civilized continent. Some historians believe that the spiral in Asian art may represent the sun, 
as it has been found on roof tiles from the Tang Dynasty near the ancient city of Chang'an. It is also often found at burial sites, and scientists believe it to represent the circle of life, how we pass on and somehow be reborn. This is probably because in some ancient civilizations, people believed that the sun was born each day, extinguished itself each night, and was reborn the next day. You might have also stumbled upon the spiral as a symbol of hypnosis and dizziness. There's no real evidence that you can hypnotize someone by making them stare into a spiral for a certain time. But its effects on our abilities to focus and our optic nerves are significant. After you've stared at a spinning spiral for quite some time, you'll notice how objects either get smaller or bigger, depending on the direction of the spiral. It's easy to understand why some experience the sensation as hypnotizing. One of the most distinctive features of DNA is its spiral shape. It's also called a double helix. The double helix is formed when two strands of DNA twist around each other, like a ladder being twisted into a spiral shape. This spiral shape is important for many reasons. First, the spiral shape allows DNA to be compact and efficient. The double helix can pack a lot of genetic information into a small space, making it possible for cells to store vast amounts of genetic material in a small area. Second, the spiral shape allows DNA to be flexible and respond to changes in our environment. Because the double helix is made up of two strands that can move relative to each other, our DNA can change its shape. Finally, the spiral shape of DNA allows it to interact with other molecules in the cell. Now, let's look at the big picture. I mean, the biggest of them all, that of the galaxies found in our universe. They're also shaped like a spiral due to their rotation and the presence of dark matter. As the galaxy spins, the stars and gas clouds within the galaxy move in a circular direction around its center. This movement creates a spiral shape as the stars and gas clouds are drawn toward the center of the whole system. Additionally, the presence of dark matter, which is a type of matter that does not interact with light, creates gravitational forces that help to shape the galaxy into a spiral. But you don't need to look that far to understand why spirals are important. Your handy corkscrew is shaped like a spiral too, because it makes it easier for you to open the wine bottle. That screw you drilled into the wall to hang a picture? Also a spiral. It helps it with some added grip and stability. Got a notebook on your desk? Those pages might be held together by a spiraled wire. It makes it easier for you to browse the notebook without damaging the pages. Even your hair strands might have a curled shape. The curlier the hair, the drier it will be. It means it will get sebum from the scalp down on the strand slower, making it easier to maintain and clean. And before I spiral out of control, <laughs> we're done here. Okay, let's play a little guessing game, shall we? Can you name the sixth largest river on Earth in terms of volume? That's the amount of water that flows through a waterway. The first couple of rivers are easy to list. Number one, of course, is the Amazon River in South America. Then we have the Congo in Africa and the Ganges in India. Feel free to name all the rivers on the planet. You won't get any closer to the answer. Why? Because this river is not on the surface but underneath the waves of the Black Sea. In 2010, a team of scientists discovered this river while studying the Bosphorus Strait in Turkey. Sonar scanning revealed a channel at the bottom of the Black Sea. The channel had water flowing through it. It turned out that at places, it's 115 feet deep. That's three times as tall as your average telephone pole. This flow of water acts like a real river. It has rapids and waterfalls, and its volume is 350 times greater than that of the River Thames in London. Huh, talk about a strong undercurrent. If it was a surface river, it would really be in the top 10. Bad news for the Madeira River in Bolivia and Brazil, the present number 6. But how did this underwater river form? The answer lies in the amazing features of the Black Sea. It gets its water from two main sources. The first are the rivers that flow into it, like the Danube, Dnieper, and Don. 
<laughs> a lot of Ds there. But more importantly, they are all freshwater waterways. On the other side, quite literally, there is the Mediterranean. And it's salty. Like, a lot. When this salt water gets inside the Black Sea, it goes straight to the bottom. You see, fresh water is lighter than salt water. This creates stratification. It's a fancy term that simply means that the two types of water don't mix together. Salt water has a higher density, so it drops right down to the bottom. If you want to see how that works, you can do an experiment at home. Pour mineral water into one cup and salt water into another. Table salt will do. Then put a grape in each cup. You'll see how it immediately sinks to the bottom of the cup filled with fresh water. The grape will stay afloat in the cup filled with salt water. The same thing is happening inside the Black Sea. But there is another side to this phenomenon. The upper layer of water is rich in oxygen. This means it can support life. The bottom layer, however, is anoxic. Yep, you guessed it. This means there is no oxygen at the bottom. But this isn't a bad thing. Because of this trait of the Black Sea, shipwrecks are able to survive for centuries. Oxygen decomposes wood. And from what material did the ancient people make their ships? That's correct, timber. Recently, in 2018, scientists discovered the oldest Greek shipwreck on Earth. The merchant ship lies more than a mile deep at the bottom of the sea. Experts estimate that the vessel is 2,400 years old. The wreck was valuable for historians to study all the elements of ancient ship construction. From the mast to the rowing benches, it's all intact. The wreck lies some 50 miles off the coast of Bulgaria. But no one has seen it in person. Explorers sent a deep-sea ROV, or remotely operated vehicle, to film the wreckage. It was impossible for a diver to go down. Hmm, but the Black Sea doesn't look that huge on a map. Could it be that deep? Oh yes, it's way deeper than people think. You could stack six Empire State Buildings at the deepest point of the Black Sea, around 7,257 feet. This inland sea isn't the only place on Earth where researchers have discovered shipwrecks and underwater rivers. One of the largest channels running along the ocean floor lies off the coast of South America. It runs from the mouth of the mighty Amazon and into the Atlantic Ocean. Studying underwater rivers isn't an easy task. The depth and the strong currents make it impossible to send in divers. Even the equipment for underwater research has to be sturdy. Otherwise, the current will just wash it away. That's why the underwater river in the Black Sea was ideal for scientists to explore. Earth's oceans and seas are powerful. But, lucky for us, there are places where divers can admire underwater rivers. Ever heard of a cenote? Sounds Spanish. Well, that's because it is. Cenotes are underground caves. They form after the limestone above collapses, revealing the groundwater under them. The term cenote is associated with the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico. Ancient Maya used them as water sources. In the Mayan language, the word cenote meant sacred well. Researchers estimate there are some 10,000 cenotes spread across the Yucatan Peninsula. You can also find them in other places, such as Cuba and Australia. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder, but unofficially, the most beautiful cenote is located just south of the town of Tulum in Mexico. The name reflects the cave's divine beauty, Cenote Angelita. But people don't visit this cenote to go swimming. Its bottom is much more interesting. A scuba tank is all you need to finally admire an underwater river firsthand. The waters are dark and foggy, so divers use powerful flashlights. After a hundred-foot dive, a marvelous sight appears. An underwater river with trees along its banks. Some of them even have green leaves, just like any other water flow on dry land. But it's not really a river. Here comes the fascinating part. Remember how salt water and fresh water don't mix? Well, the river the divers see is actually a thick layer of fog between the two types of water. Three feet of hydrogen sulfates, to be exact. 
This is the compound that water processing plants use to remove chlorine from drinking water. The substance is so heavy that the fog it produces moves independently from the surrounding water, and it creates an illusion that a river is flowing underwater. But there are other real rivers that play tricks on you. Take, for example, the Mystery River in Indiana. It's the longest underground river in the United States. Explorers discovered the river and its cave system, Blue Spring Caverns, in the 19th century. Nearly three miles of the river are navigable. Isn't that impressive? You can book a boat tour on a river that you can't even see. But the most mysterious river on the planet is the Saraswati River in India. The coolest part about it is that it doesn't exist. It was an alleged river only mentioned in ancient literature. For centuries, people thought that it was just a myth. Then satellite images showed that it might be real. Ancient texts spoke of a major confluence of three mighty rivers, the Ganges, Yamuna, and Saraswati. The first two are visible today, but where's the third one? That's what scientists decided to find out. Images from an American satellite showed the presence of underground water in the area. Until then, researchers thought that these were paleo channels. This simply means that water flowed through them a long time ago. But to their surprise, it appeared that there was still water inside these channels. Scientists estimated that the Saraswati River flowed above the ground some 5,000 years ago. But it didn't dry up completely. It just went underground, some 200 feet below the ground. Local experts believe that the river still slowly flows into the sea. The Saraswati River got hidden under the desert sand. This was a natural process, but many rivers have been forced underground because of human activity. In London, England, several dozen small and medium-sized rivers now flow under the ground. Maps from the 19th century still show them as rivers, but today they only exist in the names of the streets that were built above them, such as Fleet Street. The same thing happened in New York, but this doesn't mean that these streams have disappeared for good. When engineers want to rebuild or modify a building, they still consult city maps from centuries ago. No one wants a long-lost brook to flood their basement. So, imagine you're 15 and you get bored of playing video games. Instead, to pass the time, you decide to give some attention to an old hobby of yours, tracking down lost Mayan cities. You've heard that some ancient civilizations are said to have built entire cities based on constellations, so you decide to check out whether that was true for the Mayans. You find a book containing all the constellations the Mayan civilization believed to exist. You open good old Google Maps and map every ancient Mayan city discovered to date. You start seeing that this information actually matches. And truly, the biggest ancient Mayan cities correspond to the brightest and biggest stars of the Mayan constellations. Okay, this is getting interesting. You manage to map out over 100 ancient cities when you suddenly notice something strange. There's an area in the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico where archaeologists have unearthed two Mayan cities. But on the constellation map, there are three stars. Could this mean there is a long-lost city waiting to be discovered nearby? You might think this sounds too daydreamy, but the story is actually true. The previous account happened to a Canadian teenager named William Gadry. The boy is known as a science genius and had even won an award for the constellation theory we presented just now. When he noticed that a third city was missing from the 23rd constellation he was examining, he began to scour the internet for satellite pictures that could help him solve this mystery. He looked into images from NASA, JAXA, a Japan-based satellite company, and Google Earth. These images were still insufficient to answer his questions. So he reached out to a friend inside the Canadian Space Agency. His friend provided him with state-of-the-art satellite imagery that gave him the answer he was looking for. According to the images, there is a large square area right on the border of Mexico and Belize which looks like the remains of a city. William took the images to a remote sensing expert known as Dr. Armin LaRogue from the University of New Brunswick. 
they studied the images thoroughly and concluded that the area could be housing 30 buildings and even a large pyramid. The scientific and archaeological community went crazy with the 15-year-old's discovery. Could this really be true? Some background. Lost Mayan cities began to be unearthed in the mid-20th century. Since then, ruins from cities such as Tikal, Palenik, and Uxmal have been rediscovered. The Mayans were one of the biggest pre-Columbian civilizations living in the Americas. They began to settle in the area as early as 1500 BCE. Experts believe that, at its height, the Mayan civilization consisted of over 40 cities with a population of millions of people. That's a crowd. And their cities were pretty interesting. Their civilization spanned over Mexico's Yucatan Peninsula, Guatemala, and Belize. They survived mainly on agriculture, so they developed a complex irrigation system in most of their cities. They built a series of ceremonial buildings, pyramids, plazas, and even courts for ball games. The Mayans were keen pyramid builders, but they also developed an advanced astronomical system. With whatever ancient technology they had, they were able to predict the exact location of planets, such as Venus and Mars, and they were able to predict the exact dates of eclipses. That's why the methodology William used to discover this long-lost Mayan city was unusual, but not completely surreal. The Mayans were keen astronomers, so it wouldn't be too strange that they built their major architectural feats in relation to the sky, would it? And they wouldn't be the first ones to be doing so. There is a famous fringe of Egyptology dedicated to studying how the Giza pyramids were built in perfect alignment with the Orion constellation, meaning that each pyramid was purposely built to align with one of the major stars of Orion's belt. According to William, he first had the idea to look at the Mayan constellations because he couldn't understand why the Mayans built their cities where they built them. Most major cities, such as Chichen Itza and Uxmal, aren't near any rivers or significant bodies of water. Instead, they're built on marginal lands and on top of mountains, which confused the 15-year-old. His next thought was that it might have something to do with astronomy. William named the new city he discovered Mouth of Fire, which is also my nickname, and he even won a merit award for his hard work. However, his theory was very much contested inside the archaeological community, and many Mayan experts worked to debunk William's findings. Some archaeologists say that constellation theories are too unscientific. Anthony Aveni, a renowned anthropologist and astronomer, referred to William's methodology as an act of creative imagination. He explained that there is no way to be sure what the Mayan constellations really were. It's all just hypothetical. Another debunking of William's findings came from Mayanist David Stewart, who said that the object identified on the satellite imagery is nothing but an old cornfield. His claim was supported by an expedition that took place near the area in 2021, when the archaeologists present reported there was nothing at all in this area. Still, a 15-year-old boy almost found a long-lost Mayan city, which is pretty exciting if you ask me. Similar techniques as those used by William are actually being used to unearth lost civilizations all over the world. According to space archaeologist Sarah Parquet, satellite imagery has been a key player in discovering ancient cities in Egypt and other places. Sarah herself spends most of her days scouring images for any sign of where there could have been cities long ago. What happens, she says, is that any time you have something buried, it's going to be covered either by vegetation, soil or sand, or some other modern construction on top of it. In order to assess whether there is something hidden under large canopies of vegetation or not, she uses infrared technology, for instance. A major recent discovery in Brazil was done in a similar way. Satellite imagery detected a network of trenches dating back to 200 to 1200 CE. These suggest settlements that could have supported around 60,000 people. But in this case, the satellite imagery did indeed correspond to what was on the ground. Researchers from the University of Florida found several mounds that were accompanied by ditches and geoglyphs. Archaeologists also found remnants of carefully designed walls, centered around plazas, much like the type of construction done by the ancient Mayans. 
Advances in satellite tech have also shed new light on long-discovered ancient Mayan cities, such as Tikal. Located in the heart of the Guatemalan jungle, Tikal is believed to have been the capital of the ancient Mayan empire. At its height, it was comparable in importance to cities such as London or New York in today's world. It was composed of a series of complex monuments, many of them believed to have been the resting places of kings and chiefs. Tikal is already known to have been big, but recent discoveries show it could have been even three times larger than what scientists originally believed. The main discovery revolves around a fortification on the outskirts of the city, indicating how far the original city stretched. And new discoveries still take place. In 2017, researchers also unearthed new clues regarding the potential causes of the decline of the Mayan civilization. Using data from a site in Siebel, located 62 miles southwest of Tikal, scientists analyzed radiocarbon data from ceramics and archaeological excavations to extract new information about the sudden demise of this great civilization. The information shows that, instead of a sudden collapse, the Mayans most likely collapsed in waves of social instability and political crises. These events are believed to have deteriorated Mayan city centers and began causing the dispersion of the Mayan population. Well, it seems like it's a prime time to uncover ancient ruins. What do you say? Will you give it a try as well? Ever since Plato wrote about the allegory of Atlantis, humanity has been fascinated with the possibility of the discovery of a thriving underwater civilization. Fancy joining me on a trip to a few historic underwater sites? Let's see what we can find out about ancient civilizations. The first one on our list is what is being called the Underwater Stonehenge. Scientists have recently discovered a mysterious pile of cairns that stretch for miles under the shimmering waters of Lake Constance at the borders of Switzerland, Germany, and Austria. Archaeologists began to explore the site back in 2015, and they haven't been able to understand yet what it was actually used for. What they do know is that there is a 12-mile line of 170 human-made stone cairns under Lake Constance. Scientists say this was most likely the result of a combined work of several villages. The cairn site was probably used for some collective purpose. The formations are huge. Some of them are several dozen feet wide. The most amazing discovery so far is that the site dates back to around 5,500 years ago. Now, what were we humans doing back then? We were living in the prime years of the so-called Stone Age. We were beginning to make artifacts from stone and use them to hunt and eat. Can you imagine what a knife and fork might have looked like back in those days? It's no coincidence that scientists call this site the underwater Stonehenge though. Both sites are believed to have been built around the same period of time. You see, Stonehenge dates back to around 3100 BCE. Both sites carry the distinct characteristic of stone monuments built in a circle. Not to mention the fact that scientists also haven't figured out why on earth our early ancestors would feel the need to build a monument such as Stonehenge. Well, the mystery of Lake Constance hasn't been solved yet. Who were the Neolithic people from this area? And for what purpose did they go through such an amount of work and effort to build this huge stone site? Next, we're taking you on a tour of the Ryukyu Islands just off the coast of Japan. You're diving deep down to an archaeological site. But I should warn you, the waters of the Pacific Ocean are far from smooth. It doesn't take long before you see a huge structure, thanks to the sunlight shining down on the seabed. At first, it looks like Machu Picchu's ruins located across the globe in Peru. As you approach the site, you slowly figure out its forms. A pyramid-shaped structure, arches, staircases. It's something that could have easily been a palace or a castle. Could this be a sign of human activity? What you've just seen is known today as the Yonaguni Monument. It also goes by the name of Japan's Atlantis, 
The entire monument is about the size of five soccer fields and the height of a five-story building. Its most surprising feature is its expanse of terraces. Explorers and scientists believe that Yonaguni might be 10,000 years old. But whether it's a human-made structure or a natural formation is still under debate. For Japan's top marine geologist, Professor Masaki Kimura, Yonaguni is the heritage of a lost civilization. Kimura has dived to the bottom of the ocean to explore the ruins over 100 times over the past 10 years. According to him, there are clear signs of human activity down there. On the monument's surface, there is a triangle-shaped concave that is a historical symbol of water fountains in the region. There is also a giant turtle carved on the eastern side of the structure. And, according to Kimura, turtles have an important cultural meaning. Several pieces of stone tools have been recovered from the site. Their estimated age is around 10,000 years. However, not all scientists support this theory. For many, Yonaguni is the result of thousands of years of erosion. The fact that the monument is composed of one massive rock leads them to believe it's not human-made. The defined edges and flat surfaces resemble a natural formation in Northern Ireland, known as the Giant's Causeway. The basalt columns look like the ruins of a palace, but they're actually the result of volcanic activity in the region. Now, you're flying to the coast of Greece, four hours away from Athens. More specifically, you're in the Peloponnese Peninsula. You dust off an old snorkel and head for a free dive on a bright sunny day. Sometime into the dive, you start noticing patterns on a seabed. 13 feet below the surface, outlines of familiar objects start to appear, one by one. As you continue swimming, what looks like the outline of an entire city emerges in front of your eyes. Are you wondering how water could have taken the whole city? Rocks are perfectly aligned into what appears to be the foundation of a building. This is Pavlopetri, an ancient city you've probably heard about for the first time. It was discovered by Nicholas Fleming, a British oceanographer, when he was on vacation in Greece. He had heard rumors about Pavlopetri's existence and, indeed, found several artifacts on the seafloor. He went back to the area a year later with the team. They found a site filled with pots, storage vessels, and tools. A kern stone, for instance, is a tool used for grinding grains and turning them into flour. Multiple amphoras indicate that this settlement dates back to the Bronze Age, 5,500 years ago, when people started living in towns. The settlement is believed to have existed for over 2,400 years. Today, Pavlopetri is considered the oldest submerged town ever discovered. And what's impressive is that it wasn't a simple village. It was a vibrant port city with stone buildings, a marketplace, streets, and even squares. The next stop on our voyage is one of today's most famous underwater cities that has been turned into an archeological park. The city of Port Royal in Jamaica exists only below the surface, but in 1692, it was one of the wealthiest cities in the Western Hemisphere. Port Royal was the center of the British Empire at the time and an important trade city that attracted people from all over the region. It was also home to real-life pirates of the Caribbean. On the morning of June 7, 1692, the people of Port Royal met a different fate than they had probably expected the city woke up shaking. People were thrown out of their beds by the power of a massive earthquake, ranking 7.5 on a Richter scale. One survivor said he had seen Earth opening up and swallowing the whole town. What he said could be true, as the city was mainly built on sand. The ground swallowed buildings, roads, you name it. Geysers erupted and finally, waves as big as 10-story buildings hit the city. About 33 acres of the city disappeared under the water. Amazingly, most of its 17th century remains are still in good condition under 40 feet of water. 
archaeologists have found taverns, storage rooms, kitchens, and recreational buildings used for diverse purposes. You can also see a grand lion statue, a submerged bridge, and many picturesque arches. Of course, I saved the best for last, India. Just off its coast lies another sunken marvel. A site known as the Lost City of Cambay is located in the Gulf with a similar name. It remained undiscovered until 2001, when the National Institute of Ocean Technology made a routine water assessment. With the help of sonar technology, which sends a wave sound to the bottom of the sea, they found something far beneath the surface. Images showed well-defined geometric shapes spread along a five-mile stretch. The remains date to more than 9,500 years ago, meaning this civilization was lost at around the end of the Ice Age. Debris recovered from the site included construction material, pottery, beads, sculptures, and even bones. Scientists argue whether these artifacts are indeed from the site, but if they truly are, then the lost city of Cambay might be the oldest civilization in the world. Imagine discovering an ancient city without leaving the comfort of your home. In 1963, a man in the Nevsihir province of Turkey did exactly that. He was renovating his house. He knocked down a wall in his basement and found a mysterious room. He continued digging and saw a tunnel. This is how Darren Kuyu underground city was found. Darren Kuyu is one of the deepest multi-level underground settlements of Cappadocia and in all of Turkey. This engineering masterpiece has eight levels. The inhabitants living on those floors had access to cellars, storage areas, chapels, a school, a study room, and other structures. All floors are connected by an extensive network of tunnels. It's believed that the underground city was built as a shelter. You can't see the construction from the outside. Its depth is approximately 279 feet. The complex was large enough to shelter about 20,000 people, plus their livestock and food supplies. There's also a 180-foot ventilation shaft. People used it both for ventilation and as a well. The well supplied water both to the villagers living on the surface and to those hiding in the underground city. Interestingly, those living on the bottom levels were able to cut off the water supply for the upper and ground levels. This kept the water safe from potential poisoning. The place was designed for protection. The tunnels could be blocked from the inside with huge round rolling stone doors. The passageways were extremely narrow. Potential invaders had to enter the tunnels one at a time. Seems like they thought of everything in the 7th century BCE. Archaeologists believed the Phrygians were the ones who first built the levels. After them, the structure was used and enhanced in Roman times. This was when the chapels were added. The golden time of Darin Kuyu, however, was during the Byzantine era. But how did these people manage to create such tunnels? Well, the rock they carved them into wasn't usual. It was soft volcanic rock. It appeared due to a geological process that began millions of years ago. Volcanic eruptions covered the area in thick ash. It then solidified into this soft rock. When the natural forces of wind and water eroded softer parts, only hard elements remained. Fun fact, fairy chimneys are also made of intricately shaped volcanic soft rock, but they formed naturally without any human intervention. I'm still in Turkey, but this time, my destination is Kanakale, where a myth came to life. For 3,000 years, people believed that Homer's Iliad was fiction and that Troy never existed. In 1863, everything changed. Expatriate Frank Calvert discovered ancient ruins in western Turkey. He was convinced they belonged to the ancient city of Troy. Heinrich Schliemann examined this area in 1868. That's when Troy saw sunlight again after all those centuries. Troy has complex layers. Over the years, nine ancient cities were built on top of one another. Historians say that the area was strategically located between Europe and Asia, so it became a prosperous trade and cultural center. This strategic position made Troy attractive throughout history. After the Trojan conflict, 
the city was abandoned between the years 1100 to 700 BCE. Then Greek settlers rediscovered the area, and Alexander the Great ruled there. The Romans then invaded the city. Speaking of this event, the first thing you would see when visiting the site is a replica of the wooden Trojan horse from a movie shot in 2004. The next stop is Lothal. In the 1950s, Lothal and several other Harappan sites were discovered in India. These new provinces extended the boundaries of the Indus Valley civilization. Lothal was an important part of the Harappan civilization. It had vast cotton and rice fields. Plus, it had a bead-making factory. Beads were made from semi-precious stones, like agate. Many of these beads were later found in Mesopotamia, which serves as evidence that Lothal was a thriving trading port. Archaeologists believe that the city was part of an ancient trade route. Traces of agriculture? Check. Traces of trade? Check. What else? The remains of residential buildings, streets, bathing pavements, and drains some real city planning, and impressive examples of early urbanization. The town was well constructed. There were modern houses. Some of them had six rooms, bathrooms, a large courtyard, and even a veranda. Lothal also had the world's oldest known dock. It linked the city with the Sabarmati River and the trade route. The ancient Mayan city of Calakmul is located in southern Mexico in the tropical forest of the Tierras Bajas. From 500 CE to 800 CE, Calakmul was home to over 50,000 people. There was a central plaza surrounded by outer districts. And if we count both the inhabitants of all those outer areas and those who lived in the center, Calakmul had a population of more than 1.5 million people. It was a city that was habitable for 12 centuries. It's believed that the place had more constructions than any other excavated Maya settlements in the region. After 1000 CE, the Maya civilization there faced a downfall. The settlement that was once the center of Mesoamerica was almost completely abandoned. The ancient city was at the heart of the second largest tropical forest in America. The site is well preserved, so today, if you were to visit it, you would be able to picture what life looked like in ancient Mayan times. The city remains include architectural complexes and sculpted monuments, defensive systems, quarries, water management features, agricultural terraces, massive temple pyramids, and palaces. Not to mention a variety of body ornaments and other accompanying objects. It proves that complex state-organized societies lived in this tropical forest. The Mayans depicted nature in their paintings, pottery, sculptures, rituals, and even food. I'm moving on to a place people thought didn't really exist. The city of Thonis Heracleon appeared only in a few inscriptions and ancient texts. Turns out, it was waiting to be discovered for thousands of years. Scientists searched the majority of the coast of Egypt. But then, archaeologist Frank Gaudio and his team detected a colossal face looking at them from under the water. The ancient city of Heracleon was discovered completely submerged four miles off Alexandria's coast. In the ruins of the lost city, there were 64 ships, 700 anchors, and a treasure trove of gold coins. Archaeologists consider a 16-foot tall statue and the temple remains the most important findings discovered by the expedition. Back then, the city had ceremonies and celebrations that took place in the temple of Amun. The ruins and artifacts were made from granite and diorite, so they were in good condition even after having been in contact with water for centuries. They give people a glimpse into what life was like 2,300 years ago in one of the most important trade ports of the world. The city had a network of canals. You can think of it as an ancient Egyptian Venice. The canals linked many separate harbors and anchorages. Towers, temples, houses, and other structures were also linked by bridges. Thonis Heracleion was the country's main port for international trade and the collection of taxes. No one really knows how the city ended up submerged, but archaeologists connect it with natural causes. At the end of the second century BCE, most probably after a flood, Heracleion got covered with water. 
Then, Alexandria, the city founded by Alexander the Great, became more glorious than Heracleion. Before Alexandria's fame, Heracleion was the main port of entry to Egypt. So, after the disaster, many ships heading for Heracleion had to change their route and go to Alexandria. Heracleion lost its glory until its rediscovery in 1933. Mesa Verde is an American national park in Colorado. The park is the largest archaeological preserve in the U.S., with more than 5,000 sites, including 600 cliff dwellings. Mesa Verde means green table in Spanish. The name comes from the shape of the mountains in the area, with flat tops and steep sides. The park is an ancestral Puebloan archaeological site. Starting from 7500 BCE, a group of nomadic Paleo-Indians seasonally lived in Mesa Verde. They were hunters, gatherers, and crop farmers. They built the first Pueblos in the region. By the end of the 12th century, the Mesa Verdeans began constructing massive cliff dwellings, which are now the best-known structures in the park. 